So good afternoon, welcome, welcome back to the, uh, this uh, panel, our discussion. So this is another important initiative of our association. When the association started these activities, we have two key mandates, only two, but those two are critically important. One is setting standards, and the other one is this panel implementation assessment of the standards. The reason is very simple. Setting standards, but without any implementation, without as standards, it's not put into national legislation, national supervisory practice, there is no impact on our regulation, supervision, and policyholder protection. So we debate very much on this subject, and now, thanks to the initiative leadership of ECREM or Implementation Committee, Jonathan and uh, Tan Lee, and our Secretariat colleagues, we have very strong implementation assessment framework and also activities. So this panel is excellent panelists and leaders, chair, chairperson, coordina coordinators, or moderator. So I will introduce ECREM. ECREM is our vice chair of Implementation Committee. And what is important for, for particularly this panel is ECREM is leading this assessment of our uh, principles. And compared with a few years ago, we have a huge achievement in this area. We have now not only self-assessment, but also peer review framework, and we have achieved significant uh, ICP review and assessment under ECREM's leadership. ECREM is working for NAIC as policy advisor, and also in the U.S. side, I know that he also worked in U.S. side of this uh, uh, implementation issue or coordination cooperation with other international regulatory uh, community. So, ECREM, floor is yours, and we look forward to your panel. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. So thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon to discuss implementing ICPs and assessment as the first step. I'm joined today by a distinguished panel, um, Michael Haifman, Jose Lopez Hoyo, and Damien Jaworski. I'm gonna introduce them all shortly, but as noted, implementation is critically important. Ultimately, standards are only as good as their implementation by the jurisdictions who are members of the IAS. The assessments are critical in order to develop the baseline, and the IAS began a program in 2012 of self-assessment and peer review. Ultimately, our goal was to assist the IAS members understand gaps in implementation and to provide feedback in a continuous loop back to our standard-setting activities. Our members can use these assessment results to help improve supervisory development and capacity building through targeted seminars, training materials, or leverage other IES partners. The IES has taken the feedback to stand setting groups, and are, as a result of our work, those ICPs are now being revised. As our initial round of self-assessment and peer reviews, SAPRs as you'll hear, come to an end, Version 2.0 of these will include GSI policy measures implementation assessment over three years, and this may extend to Comframe and the ICS. So this afternoon, we're gonna hear from three different perspectives on maximizing the value of an assessment to improve the ICP's implementation, practical challenges to increasing observance of the ICPs, and the importance of periodical evaluations. First, we're gonna hear from Michael Haifman, who is one of our distinguished fellows. He's also the director of the Toronto Center and chairs its Insurance and Pensions Advisory Board. He helps jurisdictions build capacity on financial regulation and supervision, and previously worked in both Canada and the US and was the assistant superintendent at the Office for Superintendents Financial Institutions Canada. Then we'll hear from Jose Lopez Soyo, he is the Vice President of Analysis and Sectoral Studies at the National Insurance and Surety Commission, CNSF Mexico. He was recently appointed in 20, early 2016, and he is in charge of updating the solvency standards and capital model for Mexico. 
And this is the second time Jose is with CNSF, and he was there from 2001 to 2008 as well. And then we're also joined by Damian Jaworski, who is the Director of Analysis and International Cooperation for KNF, the Polish Financial Supervision Authority, since January 2012. And he joined KNF in 20, 2009 as Deputy Director for International Cooperation. And he is in charge of banking, insurance, pensions, as well as cross sectoral issues. So please join me in welcoming our panelists, and I'll welcome Michael to the podium. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akram. Uh, the slides say Toronto Centre, and Toronto Centre, if some of you don't know, is a, a non-profit organization that works on uh, training financial sector regulators and supervisors across all sectors, not just insurance. Uh, that's not uh, my full-time job. I do lots of other things, and I've been involved on the, uh, the self-assessment and peer review uh, projects for the IAIS and worked as an FSAP assessor uh, of a number of countries as well. And so what I've got to say to you is sort of pulls on that, uh, that broad experience. And uh, I want to uh, give you my thoughts on what makes uh, for an, a, a successful and, uh, and useful assessment. Uh, I, I think that assessments, uh, whatever their purpose uh, might be in particular, uh, should be done to help drive change and improvement. Uh, if, if you're not seeking improvement, then it's sort of an academic exercise. And so really important to do that. And I'm going to, uh, to set out five main steps uh, that I th think, uh, based on what I've seen uh, countries do, uh, is going to uh, help you uh, produce a successful uh, assessment process. I'll talk at the end about different types of assistance that uh, are available uh, to supervisors in doing it. So it's not uh, necessarily an easy thing to do, um, but uh, you don't have to go it alone either. So the, uh, the first thing that I would say, uh, like almost anything, it's important to prepare for the assessment and really think about what uh, objectives you're trying to achieve. You know, are you trying to get uh, broad-based improvements in the implementation? Are you trying to uh, uh, look in detail at things in advance of an FSAP and look at things that you have to improve? Is there a particular area that, uh, that needs improvement in your regulation and supervision uh, that you're, you're trying to target? Uh, you know, very important to be clear on that. And I, I think for an assessment to work, uh, there should be buy-in uh, from the top of the organization. So uh, don't just make it a project that you assign to a policy person uh, to do an assessment and, uh, and report back on the results, uh, but really look at it as part of uh, a change initiative uh, in the organization. Uh, so you've got to uh, establish the, the scope of what you're going to assess. Is it going to be all the ICPs or just some of them? Uh, allow a reasonable time frame uh, to do it. Uh, it doesn't have to take years to accomplish, uh, but uh, it's pretty tough to do a, a good job in, uh, in a week or two. Uh, now, for FSAPs, that's what's expected of assessors, uh, to do a, a good job in, in a two-week period. Uh, but if you're doing it yourself, uh, no need to rush it that much. Uh, take more time and, uh, and really take a thorough look at, uh, at how things are working. Um, should have a team to do the assessment. As I say, just assigning it to one person, uh, I don't think you're going to get a, a good result uh, because the ICPs cover a, a broad range of topics and it's not likely you're going to have one person in your organization that knows all of the, uh, the topics well and can really take a, a, a good hard look at, uh, at what you're doing and whether you're uh, up to standard on it. Um, also, the, uh, the assessment should be looking at not just the, uh, the legislation and guidance that you've got in place, but what you're doing in practice in your day-to-day -day supervision and how well it's working. And so, uh, roping in people from across the organization uh, to really get a, a full view of how things are working on the ground is important. Uh, 
have a plan for what you're going to do. Uh, that seems obvious, but uh, I'll talk more about planning in a few minutes. Uh, not necessarily a strength of uh, supervisors that I've seen. Uh, review previous assessments. And so it's, uh, it's rare that there's a country now that's not been assessed in one way or the other. Uh, be it through an FSAP or through a, a regional assessment process that's been done by regional groups of supervisors or their own self-assessment or the IIS uh, self-assessment and peer review process, uh, there's almost always something that's there uh, to start from. And so, you know, look at what's been done, uh, how things have progressed since then, and, uh, and build on that. Uh, you know, understanding the assessment methodology is important. Um, and, you know, what the ratings mean, and, and, and I think that's not so much important uh, whether you rate yourself observed or largely observed or partly observed, uh, but important to really understand um, uh, sort of what's expected uh, by the principles and standards and, uh, and also the need to focus on what's going on currently. So plans to do things in the future, uh, they're nice and good to take into account as you plan your improvements, uh, but they shouldn't really uh, enter into the assessment of where you are at currently. And definitely for an FSAP, uh, they don't count. Um, understanding the ICPs that you're going to assess. Uh, I'll talk more in detail about that in a minute, but uh, looking at uh, core curriculum materials, for example, give yourself an orientation as to, uh, to what that area of supervision or regulation is all about and what sort of things uh, you need to look at and, and why those uh, requirements might be there. Uh, identify the information that you need, so you have to collect legislation, regulations, uh, guidance, uh, but also information about uh, you know, what your supervisory practices are and uh, what your experience has been, for example, in uh, applying enforcement actions. Have they worked or haven't they? Uh, then performing the assessment. Uh, one thing I would emphasize is, is the need to, uh, to give a broad consideration, uh, not just focusing on uh, what's written on the paper, uh, but what's actually going on in practice, and uh, the different ICPs and standards deal with different uh, aspects. So some of them talk about supervisory powers, others talk about the nature of requirements that are there that apply to the industry, uh, some talk about uh, the supervisory practices. And, and so uh, you know, they're, they're quite different from one to the next in what they're looking at. Uh, and to really do a good assessment, uh, you need to understand the purpose of the standards and the principles that are there. Um, it seems sort of obvious, but uh, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap of just uh, reading the words on the paper and saying, well, oh yes, we do that, uh, looking at the standard, but uh, without digging deeper, looking at the guidance, looking at, uh, at the uh, the core curriculum sort of materials to explain you know, why it is that supervisors should be doing these things, it's easy to give yourself a, a good grade for doing something that's, uh, that's just really scratching the surface of, of what should be done. And so an important question to ask yourself is, is why? You know, why is this requirement there? And uh, if we understand that purpose, uh, are we actually achieving that in what we're doing? Uh, so getting to the actual assessment, uh, you know, three key things to look at. So what's written down there? You know, do your powers that are in the law match up to what's required? Uh, do the requirements that you've got on the insurance companies uh, stack up to what the, uh, the standards are calling for? Uh, you know, what's actually being done? So it's, uh, I, I can't tell you how many countries I've been to that had perfectly fine requirements on the books, uh, but they weren't enforcing them. And so they don't really do that much good then. And, and so really looking at, uh, at what action you're taking to implement what you've got to work with, and then uh, is it working well or isn't it? Um, and I would say be honest and realistic about it. And you know, don't just... Uh, uh, think about your own situation and, and try to use that to assess uh, 
uh, what you're doing in a vacuum, uh, but look at what's going on elsewhere. And so most supervisors are part of regional organizations, and you've got access to, uh, to others in your region. Uh, find out what they're doing and how they're uh, dealing with a particular issue. Uh, you know, of course, the uh, FSAPs are almost all published on the IMF website, and so you can go and take a look at those and, and see what's being done there. So the FSAP reports talk not just about uh, what the ratings are and the shortcomings, uh, but they also provide some pretty comprehensive descriptions about, uh, about what's actually being done by the supervisors. And so, for example, if people are looking at macroprudential supervision, uh, I'd send them off uh, oftentimes to look at the uh, Australia FSAP report because Australia does a particularly good job of that and I know that the uh, report documents that in some detail. Uh, so there are resources there, uh, but uh, benchmark yourself against what others are doing. Uh, then, you know, you've done the assessment, uh, made some ratings, and then you've got to step back and say, well, okay, what do we do about that? Uh, you know, if you're lucky and you're in a developed country that's, uh, that's been working at supervision with a big team of competent people for many decades, uh, you might have a very short list of things that really need attention. And so in that case, prioritization is not such a problem. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of places that I've gone to uh, where the list can get very, very long uh, very quickly. And so, uh, and it, it's sort of an inverse uh, uh, relationship. Uh, the longer the list it is, uh, generally the smaller number of capable people there are to, to whittle things off the list and make the improvements. And, and so, you know, there's a temptation to, to try to take on everything and improve everything at once, uh, but uh, usually the outcome of that is that uh, nothing gets improved very well. So really focus on uh, what are the highest priority problems, where are the biggest shortcomings in your observance, uh, you know, which of these uh, pose the biggest threats to achieving your supervisory objectives, and you know, how urgent is it that they be solved? So, you know, is there something that's affecting the strength in your industry? Uh, if so, then better to turn your attention to that and to something that uh, is maybe of less urgent uh, academic interest. And finally, think about uh, how much time and resource it's going to take to deal with them. So. Uh, there might be things that are going to take uh, a couple of years to work out. You might get started on those now, but is there something uh, that you can do quickly to get a quick win and uh, improve things, <coughs> excuse me, in the short run uh, that might be uh, useful to tackle early on? Uh, so planning your solutions. Uh, you know, once you've got the uh, the problems that you want to focus on identified, uh, you need ways to, uh, to solve that. And so having some action plans uh, is, is an important way to, uh, to work out what you're going to do and when and give uh, some benchmarks for uh, progress in achieving those things. Uh, you know, action planning is something that uh, we include in most of the Toronto Centre programs. And I can tell you that uh, when I first started uh, working with supervisors on that topic, I thought, isn't this just common sense? Doesn't everybody uh, work out things step by step, what they're going to do and when and who's responsible? And, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the way things work, right? Uh, but in fact, uh, it, it doesn't work that way. And, uh, and actually, uh, people tend to struggle with that. And, and so um, it's, it's a very uh, important concept and, and something that's, uh, that's not as easy to apply as, as you might think. Um, but, uh, you know, thinking about what you want to do in your plan to, uh, to solve the problem, uh, supervisors seem to want to jump first to writing some more regulations. Now, that's going to solve everything. Let's do some more regulations. Well, uh, if the problem is that you're not enforcing and applying the regulations that you've got already very well, then adding some more onto the list isn't going to help you very much. And so a lot of things might be done uh, besides just uh, doing more regulations uh, that are going to actually have more impact in the end.
And so important to focus on that. Uh, look at what's worked for uh, others uh, in your region, uh, in your own jurisdiction even, uh, in other sectors perhaps. Um, so there's a lot you can learn from what's worked elsewhere and you can also learn from other people's failures because not everything works. As well as you plan it out, uh, there are going to be uh, some mistakes. And then uh, you know, think about the key stakeholders. So we've talked a lot about stakeholders today. Uh, we saw a bunch of them in the last panel. Uh, in each country, there are going to be a set of stakeholders, and the industry uh, players are going to be certainly uh, one uh, key group of stakeholders, but there are others as well. So you've got consumers, you've got government ministries, uh, and, and lots of folks to, to think about and get on side to do things that you want to do. And for some of the problems that you've got to solve, it may be easy to get them on board. And for others, it might be a, a more difficult progress. So think about that as you prioritize things and, uh, and set about tackling them. And then uh, finally, uh, once you've got your plans, you've got to uh, put them into action. So no good to have a lot of uh, fancy plans on the paper, but not actually get the uh, implementation done. And so enough resource to, to do the job. Um, you know, sometimes there's not going to be much available, but uh, you've got to make do with what you've got. And if you need to cut corners, uh, then uh, that's probably a reasonable thing to do. And so I, I can't think of uh, any of the countries that I work with uh, regularly that have the resources to develop uh, capital adequacy standards from scratch and analyze the risks and the risk weights and so forth. It's just, uh, it's not realistic. And so, you know, what do you do? You find a, a, a model that you can uh, start with and you adapt that to your own situation. And that might be practical to do that and do your field testing and get the industry involved in discussing it. Uh, but the, uh, the fundamental basic research is just not in the cards in, in most places. Um, so communication is important, uh, consultation is key, uh, and the action plans that I see uh, drafted in Toronto Centre programs, uh, one of the, th the biggest shortcomings is typically people not allowing much time for the consultation. And so they'll give themselves six months to come up with a proposal and then give the industry three weeks to, uh, to give feedback on it. And so, you know, I've, I've got to stop and say, well, come on, be realistic. Uh, if it's going to take you this long to put it together, shouldn't they have more time to consider it and give you some feedback? And by the way, if you're looking for feedback on financial things uh, in January or February, uh, maybe you, you need to allow a little extra time because they've got other things that they're doing. Um, then in the end, of course, uh, always good to have a feedback loop. And so you've implemented things, uh, go back a year, two years, three years later and say, is this working the way that we hoped? Uh, maybe you do that through another assessment. Um, maybe you, you're less formal about it and just look at the uh, particular plans that you've tackled and see how they have worked out. Uh, types of assistance, uh, lots of things that I've seen used. Uh, Toronto Centre programs uh, cover lots of different territory and so we've had regional programs that have focused on certain sets of ICPs. Uh, we've had uh, country programs that have uh, helped with uh, the post-FSAP implementation. So I remember working with one country in South America that had had an FSAP and we worked with their team to, uh, to look at the areas where they had the biggest weaknesses and develop plans for uh, uh, for improving in those areas. Um, you know, on the uh, assessments, uh, you know, FSAPs are an important set of uh, third-party validation uh, for what needs to be done. And the self-assessment and peer review uh, program is, uh, is a different way of looking at it. Uh, I might talk a bit more about that later, uh, but uh, very important. Um, you could get uh, guided self-assessments and so I've, I've worked some with countries like uh, Libya, for example. Uh, not an IAIS member, uh, not familiar really with the ICPs in detail, but uh, sit down and work with the people over a week or two and go through the ICPs and help them to assess where they stand. And so, you know, lots of things can be done. Uh, capacity development, 
uh, different types of technical assistance to focus on particular areas of weakness and, uh, and the core curriculum as well. Um, I, I think uh, from my experience that's a, a very underutilized resource um, that uh, can help get you up the learning curve quickly on, uh, on what ought to be done and, uh, and on answering the question why. So I'll leave it there and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's turn now to Pepe, who's going to give us a little bit of background on Mexico's experience with the FSAPs. Thanks, Ekram. I, I just want to take the opportunity to, to thank uh, the MNB from Hungary, the Hungary Supervisory Authority, for this uh, excellent venue and this marvelous city, and also the IAS Secretariat for all the work that is uh, behind all this. And uh, well, um, so I, I will start just with a uh, I mean, what has happened in, in Mexico, and, and I think that it's a, a good example on, on assessments. I mean, once uh, somebody in, my, in, in, in the commission asked me uh, how long will it take the assessment, and I told him forever, because we are always in an assessment. I mean, either it's a uh, self-assessment or an FSAP or an assessment from a peer uh, regulatory authority. I mean, you're always in an assessment, and, and that's good. I mean, because you're always changing, and, and regulation is always changing, and, and that's okay. So, um, well, uh, the regulatory changes in Mexico on the road to international standards, the assessments, uh, Mexico assessment experience, and some final considerations. Uh, just this is a, a brief view of what has uh, happened in Mexico over the last 100 years. But uh, let's say um, the first law, or, or the, the law that was previous to, to, to the one that, uh, that uh, was, uh, is recently implemented, uh, it started in, in 1935. And um, along the, all these uh, years, that's uh, 60 years, I mean, there were, like, uh, on average, like two legal changes every decade. And then suddenly, something happened. And, and, and while well, this period is what we call the directive regulation in, in Mexico, I mean, we told the insurance companies everything they had to, to do. And, and then something happened, and, and wow. Be, uh, I, I mean, changes almost uh, on average, one every year. And then, well, the, the new law. Okay, so um, what happened? Well, basically, in 1984, IIS was formed. Uh, and, and we have this directive regulation. And in 99, uh, the first uh, set of insurance course principles were, were established. And uh, I mean, the good thing about insurance course principles is that uh, they, they tell you where you have to be. I mean, they, they, they set you the roadmap. And, and for many countries, I mean, this is uh, just uh, the, the, the greatest uh, framework that, uh, that you can have. I mean, it, it tells you what to do. And, and, and sets you the roadmap. How many years it takes? Well, it, it's part of, uh, of the work that we have to do, but uh, I mean, the roadmap is, is there. So, uh, well, in 2003, we have the, the first revision of ICPs, and then uh, in 2011, a second revision on ICPs, 2015, uh, another revision on ICPs, and uh, well, uh, uh, in all that time, we went from directive regulation to a kind of solvency regulation, and now we're in a solvency regulation, um, solvency two type uh, of regulation in Mexico with uh, the three pillars. Um, on the road to international standards, well, assessment processes, they facilitate, uh, identify financial and, and economic vulnerabilities, assess against international standards, and detect gaps in the regulatory uh, structures and practices and provide elements for regulatory framework uh, reforms. And, and here you have uh, all the spectrum of, uh, of assessment mechanisms. I mean, the self-assessments, and then you have uh, up to the FSAPs. And, and yes, uh, as, as Michael said, uh, I mean, sometimes you have to make an FSAP for a two-week period. They're quite stressful, 
and it's, uh, it's a I mean, honestly, it's kind of horrible experience <laughs> because I mean, you, you don't you, you don't sleep for for a while, and but uh, once you have made like many assessments, you you start uh, accumulating uh, some some knowledge, so you know uh, some things on on what to say and what you have and and what to prove and and everything. And and self assessments are are are, are, are I mean are, are quite uh, fun because I mean it it also helps to integrate the the organizations. Uh, once we, we asked, uh, I, I don't remember in, in what assessment, but uh, once we asked one of the groups, the, the lawyers, about how we were complying on, on licensing and on the operational guys, they also, we also asked. And for one uh, group, we were like fully uh, observance, and for the other, we had no non observance. So it's like, wow, I mean, such a divergence, but and, and that helps. I mean, self assessments h help a lot, and, and they are quite honest. I, I mean, within the, the, the organization, and, uh, and and sets a, 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 a good framework. And well, um, here in, in in the assessments, well, you have the self assessment. I mean, it's uh, probably the, the degree of rigor. You have to be more, like more rigorous on the FSAP, but I believe that uh, self-assessments, I mean, they, they help you to be like more honest within the organization. I mean, because people just say, okay, yes, it's, it's under regulation, but we really aren't complying with that. Uh, probably corporate governance, I mean, it's in regulation, but we know that uh, some companies, they don't have real corp corporate governance. I mean, the, the board, it's, it's completely captured by the owner of the company. So are we, we, are we really fulfilling the corporate governance principle or not? So, so th those kind of questions are, are the ones that you are permitted to, uh, that you can permit yourself to have in, in the self-assessments. And uh, well, just some experience, in this uh, road of many years, but uh, in, in the first set of, of insurance core principles, that's how we looked on, on, on uh, self-assessment among all the principles. And uh, uh, here are the, the, the first set with, that were 17 principles. And uh, on, on, on an improvement between 93 and 97, we have uh, small improvements. Uh, probably in some issues like derivatives and uh, uh, reinsurance, we have a, a major uh, effort and, 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 we, and we made some, some progress. Then between uh, 1997 and, and 2003, we made some more progress on derivatives and uh, I mean some, some technical stuff. And um, finally, between uh, 2003 and 2005, we were almost complying all, all principles in, in, in the in, in, in this improvement, we were lacking two. These two were the organization of, uh, oh sorry, the organization of the insurance supervisor and corporate governance. And uh, although, I mean, in the corporate governance I have explained the regulation was in there, but uh, we were quite afraid that we were not complying and that we were not supervising uh, correctly how corporate uh, governance was done in, within the companies. And about the organization of insurance supervisor, well, that's an issue that uh, we have because we haven't had any improvement in all these years. And uh, it's, it's part of uh, the things that, that we are lacking. And then, well, the, the, it came the, the self-assessment uh, for the 2011 revision. We were pretty well when, when, when when, when we started, given that uh, with the previous uh, core of, of, of insurance core principles, we were also doing pretty well, but uh, we were lagging in some principles. And, um, and, uh, but, uh, and, and, and this is funny because here I, I'm comparing what we did for the self-assessment and what the uh, FSAP told us. So, uh, for example, in, in this principle, that is uh, principle uh, 25, consumer protection. We were telling the, the FSAP that, uh, that we were fully observed, but uh, the FSAP came and said, okay, no, you're not uh, really fully observing it. You are only largely observing it and uh, even something be, uh, below that. Uh, although there were some others that we were quite uh, critical within ourselves. You know, um, uh, for example, 
risk assessment and management and uh, information and transparency to the market. We were like, uh, okay, there were some regulations and, and, and companies were being transparent to the market, but we were a little afraid that the market wasn't reading the, all this transparency that we were implementing in that time. So, uh, I mean, we, we were like uh, more, more rigorous within ourselves and, and telling us, okay, I mean, they are transparent, but is it used to be transparent? I mean, how can we make that uh, all this transparency is used by the market? So that's why we were more rigorous, but the FSAP decided, okay, you are doing okay with the transparency issues. And uh, here are some of the recommendations that uh, they were given us in 2011 by the EFSAP. And, and I'm just going to, to read uh, some of them. With respect to ICP3, that was uh, the organization of the insurance supervisor. Um, one recommendation was to approve the new law that was approved in 2013 to grant required powers to the CNSF to, for a more efficient supervision. Okay, that, that was achieved. And then the introduction of an explicit mechanism for the appointment or withdrawal of the CNSF president or the members of the board. That's something that uh, we have had in every FSAP and we haven't complied with it. So uh, for us, it is very important that uh, in every FSAP, uh, it is stressed that we are not complying with this issue because it's, uh, we believe that it's uh, quite important. Uh, the supervisory authority should have full discretion or Resource allocation, no, we don't have. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, we depend on the Ministry of Finance, and as well, we depend on the budget of the, of the government. And uh, well, here are all the, all the recommendations that were given to us in, in 2011. And uh, well, here are the recommendations uh, that they gave us in, in some of the principles that were downgraded within our self-assessment. Uh, the green ones and the, and the green letters are the ones that uh, in another self-assessment that we recently conducted in 2015, we believe that we have complied. But uh, many of the recommendations is, uh, were that uh, uh, this is specifically expressed in Article 485 of the new proposed law. I mean, the FSAP here uh, were, was downgrading, downgrading us uh, because we didn't have the law, although we were implementing it. So in, the, in these cases, I mean, it was uh, kind of, uh, of backwards. I mean, we were uh, implementing some, some, some insurance code principles, but we uh, lacked some of the legal uh, issues just for, for protection of the, of, of the supervisor. On uh, self-assessment of 2011, uh, for, uh, against the 2011 one, we believe that we are complying pretty well with almost everything, except, as I said before, uh, principle three, and uh, for that time, the principle one, that is all the ma ma macro environment, uh, conditions for, for effective insurance supervisions and supervisory authority. These are the two issues that even with our new law, uh, we are lagging behind. And um, just uh, some final considerations about uh, Mexican experience is that, uh, and, and I was telling it up, uh, at the beginning, uh, the market changes, the conditions change, therefore regulation must change. Uh, the best way to confirm that the market is changing is by considering what is happening in other jurisdictions and knowing what is happening in their markets. There is always a resistance to change. I mean, you will always have a resistance to change, so having a self-assessment helps you because uh, I mean, you, you can tell the stakeholders, okay, uh, look, uh, we, are, we are not complying with ICPs, we will change the law, and, and it gives you a, a good uh, mechanism to, to set conversations with all the stakeholders, and you start uh, dragging down the, the resistance. Support is helpful, uh, either international organizations, uh, monetary fund, uh, I mean, everybody, it's, it's, it's quite different to go into Congress and say, okay, I want to change the law, than saying, okay, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, World Bank and the IMF uh, says and recommends us to change some of these things. It's quite different. It's a completely, uh, it's, it's another story. Uh, yes, to have this, this support. Uh, Self-assessment give us an idea of, of where we are. Third-party assessment support the required change 
that uh, they also give uh, and have another another view on on, on what you are uh, thinking that uh, where you are and and well just uh, the next steps for 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 Mexico we have uh, recently have a, an FSAP a partial FSAP under microprudential uh, um, this new uh, macroprudential uh, perspective of the IMF. It was only done for partially for insurance. It was fully done for banking. And, uh, and while we're planning to have a self-assessment on the revised ICP that uh, came in, in November uh, 2015, somewhere in the near future. Okay. Thank you, Pepe. I'd like to call on Damien now to provide his regional perspective. Good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to be here. In uh, my presentation, I will try to give you some insight uh, into what are the priorities and uh, benchmarks for supervisors in developing uh, local regulatory framework, and also how and uh, to what extent ICPs are used in this context. I will also speak about uh, relations uh, between self-assessment and peer reviews as well as uh, FSAPs, which in uh, practice, as one of the observations uh, made, are not linked to each other and therefore do not contribute uh, to better preparing and conducting both exercises. Unlike uh, Pepe, uh, my presentation is not going to be neither country nor ICP specific. Uh, these observations are um, prepared on an aggregated basis and more or less present to a large extent a situation in uh, the region which I coordinate, which is the Central Eastern European and Transcaucasia region. Although ICPs uh, are at the top of uh, standard setting priorities of the authorities in my region, I will later show you that as far as prioritization of implementation activities is concerned, uh, the situation uh, looks uh, quite uh, different. Uh, apart from that, uh, the graph uh, presents pretty well the uh, situation of countries in the region, which is mainly a region of uh, emerging economies, uh, a, a region with substantial uh, presence of foreign companies, therefore a region which is primarily focused on developing its own regulatory environment rather than substantially contributing to international standards, in particular those related to group supervision. The uh, observance of ICPs depends in the first place on whether we can sufficiently understand the principles. In practice, there seems to be uh, many obstacles to, to fulfilling this, one could say, basic condition. Supervisors lack sufficient human resources to do proper assessment of their practices. They also not necessarily have time to study ICPs thoroughly and in result do not conduct self-assessment based on them. In addition, in uh, quite a number of cases, implementation of uh, IAS principles is not entirely in the hands of supervisors themselves. This is a question that actually was uh, to some extent raised earlier today, what uh, implementation really means. The consequence of insufficient scope of uh, competences is twofold. We are aware that uh, we cannot do much without legislation passed, for instance, by parliaments, and therefore do not consider ICPs as benchmark, or we actually overestimate our competences and on this basis make wrong assumptions as regards level of observance of ICPs. My observation is that when developing their own regulatory framework with limited resources, plenty of daily regulatory tasks, members follow in the first place examples of provisions and practices of neighboring jurisdictions, 
with similar legal framework, market conditions, and at least to some extent developed supervisory practices, rather than drawing inspiration straight from ICPs. This leads me to a conclusion that uh, ICPs should be supplemented with uh, appropriately selected examples of their practical application to be considered as a benchmark more, more broadly and in particular in uh, uh, emerging uh, uh, jurisdictions. Contrary to the first graph uh, which you saw, when it comes to presenting priorities related to issues which engage authorities on a daily basis, the importance ascribed to ICPs uh, reflected as prioritization of self-assessment and peer reviews is far from red area. On average, uh, only eight out of 25 members of uh, my region participate in uh, suppers. Again, the preference of the authorities focus on aspects uh, of uh, practical uh, application of uh, different uh, activities of their neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, they, they focus on daily supervisory cooperation. They focus on sharing knowledge and experience or participating in assessments which are initiated outside the remits of their powers. The disproportion in prioritization of FSAP and SAPRS, which is clearly seen here, confirms that uh, high on the list of priorities are tasks we need to execute. It appears that we are still missing arguments for moving SAPR higher on that list. The positive attitude towards self-assessing the observance I mentioned earlier relates to another issue. We, in principle, seem to be considering ourselves complying with any benchmark to a larger extent than it is in reality. This optimism may have painful consequence consequences when confronted with uh, external assessments, for instance, FSAP. In result, jurisdictions are discouraged from uh, participating in uh, future self-assessments. This uh, immediately makes me recall uh, one of the slides uh, earlier shown by Michael, uh, which underlined the need to be honest and realistic. It looks like, at least among my colleagues, realism and honesty still is, uh, in this at least, exercises, uh, lacking. Uh, something which you can uh, clearly see on the graph, but definitely deserves uh, a separate panel, is financial inclusion as last priority on the list. I won't comment on that, but uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, definitely something uh, one could uh, discuss at length uh, on another occasion. So why this first step, as self being self-assessment and peer review, is so difficult? Uh, SAPs as self-assessments are considered as not contrib contributing extensively to developing supervisory practices and increasing I ICP observance. This is because these assessments being done in a more subjective way on the authorities themselves, in a consequence may lead, like I just have said earlier, to, to optimistic conclusions. In this particular case, this prevents simply assessing themselves better. It prevents more intensive work uh, related to upgrading supervisory practices and observance of ICPs. Also, another factor which is being considered and highlighted is that there is a delay in receiving feedback which does not uh, allow for immediate actions in result of the uh, assessment made. Um, undoubtedly, there is also a positive element uh, because uh, once the work is undertaken and, uh, uh, and self-assessment is, is made, there is in, uh, uh, in all cases at least some work, some homework done uh, in advance 
uh, in order to at least some extent study and attempt to understand ICPs in order to uh, conduct self-assessment. Undoubtedly, at least to some extent, this contributes to understanding ICPs. As for uh, FSAP, they are considered very demanding and exhaustive exercises, but uh, these assessments are also considered as being much more useful and helpful. The reason for that is that they are done by external parties with more critical attitude, and in this way, uh, assessment done is considered more objective. Hence, it gives better picture of, in case there is a need, what must be done in order to upgrade the level of observance of ICPs. FSAPs, as such, also take less time, and therefore observations can be considered almost immediately as feedback is given while assessors interact with uh, uh, members of the authority, and also quite often reports are drafted on the, sports, on the spot, and at least uh, their drafts are delivered because, uh, before mission leaves uh, the country. On the downside of FSAP, which has also been uh, underlined by quite a number of jurisdictions, and I think at least to some extent also mentioned by Pepe. Um, in case of my region, uh, there is, and I'm very happy about it, very close cooperation between the authorities. They exchange uh, observations and experience on almost every basis. And in case a similar jurisdiction with similar market profile uh, uh, institutional arrangements uh, and, uh, and legislative fr framework uh, goes through an FSAP and uh, results are ready, they tend to compare. An observation from this comparison is that sometimes uh, assessments uh, relating to one would say similar conditions give uh, quite different output in terms of recommendations for particular jurisdictions. The conclusion is uh, here, uh, which was brought to my attention, that perhaps something needs to be done on the side of uh, the authority which uh, conducts FSAP to make sure that uh, there is uh, wider compared and greater to a, to a higher extent comparability of ass assessments made. Summing up, uh, the authorities, again, let me underline this, uh, at least uh, as regards the CET region, express very high interest in experience sharing programs, joint which is joint inspections, study visits, seminars, sharing practical solutions and examples of implementing ICPs, discussing and implementing so-called best practices and consider as necessity to hold discussions on progress in achieving intermediate supervisory goals with the countries from the region. With this, I would like to conclude and in fact reiterate a message that having in mind the relevance that usually is ascribed to the ICPs as internationally recognized principles and the participation rate in self-assessment and peer reviews in my region, the missing piece of the picture seems to be that supervis supervisors are most keen on learning from each other about practical examples of daily supervision, and it should be considered as a motivating factor in all IAS activities to supplement our standards with examples of their practical application. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. So what we'll now do is we'll have some time for question and answer. Uh, I'm going to kick off with a few questions and then I'm gonna encourage those in the audience to start thinking of some questions to pose to our panelists. So first we'll start with a question from Michael. Michael, you described a process that includes five parts, uh, preparing for the assessment, performing that assessment, prioritizing the problems, planning for solutions, and putting the plans into action. 
In your opinion, which one is the most important? Yeah. Um, since I um, started thinking about that, uh, that question, I've, I've hit upon a couple of different possible answers. And I, I think uh, I could almost uh, justify any of the five steps as being the most important. But, uh, but forced to make a choice, uh, I, I think uh, the highest priority I would put would be on actually prioritizing the problems. I, I think that's, uh, you know, the preparing and the performing the assessment uh, require a lot of thought, and they're, uh, but they're sort of mechanical exercises. You know, you work your way through, you consider what you should be doing and how well you, what you're doing stacks up against it. Uh, but then when you identify the shortcomings, you know, how do you decide which ones to tackle first and, and which ones to come later? So I, I think that's really key. Uh, probably second, I would put the, uh, the putting the plans into action. Uh, because, as I said before, uh, planning is not a strength that I've seen in a lot of supervisors that I work with, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, but even having plans in place uh, is, is not enough. You've got to actually be able to, uh, to get them done. And, and I've seen uh, real weaknesses in the implementation skills of, of many supervisors. And so it's easy to have a plan that's got the, uh, the seven or eight steps in it that we're going to do, uh, but then you, you put the plan in, uh, on the books and ignore it. And, and so a year goes by, two years go by, and it's not getting done. Uh, you know, really the, the basics of managing the work, making sure that it's happening, uh, are, are really key. And so you know, if you can't prioritize and you can't uh, put the plans into action, then uh, the rest of it is sort of an academic exercise. Great, thank you. I think the concept of prioritizing the problems, that seems to be something that the IMF is now looking at as well and trying to prioritize certain ICPs as more macro financially relevant in addition to uh, the relevant standards at, on the Basel Committee and then for IOSCO. So Pepe, you had mentioned that the IMF is going to be conducting an FSAP this year of Mexico, and it will be a targeted FSAP for the insurance sector at least. Uh, perhaps you could just touch upon your experience with FSAPs in the past and recommendations you have to improve upon them, and your opinions related to the IMF's revised approach to FSAPs and choosing a subset of ICPs and standards going forward. Okay, okay, thanks, Ekram. Uh, uh, well, uh, after, uh, as you see in Mexico experience, there's this, uh, uh, the, the, the problem with the regulator and that we haven't improved in like about 20 years. And um, I believe that one of the problems is that the, the recommendations of the IMF, they always put that issue as a medium term priority. When you always take into medium term, I mean, and when you're a regulator and you go to Congress and you, I mean, if, you, if they see medium term, that means, okay, not important. That's, that's exactly the same wording as not important. So, so IMF should be like really careful on, on, on this issue that they put, uh, I mean, uh, more important or, or for, for the near term, the medium term and afterwards because uh, after medium term, some of the things that they recommend for the medium term and, and after, they, are never, they never get done. And, and that's, that's an issue that they, they should improve. Uh, another issue that uh, they should improve is, is that they have to be focused, uh, m more focused, uh, given, uh, for example, in, in, in Mexico experience, with, uh, again, with the same principle, uh, you start talking about, uh, I mean, some, some more, more a framework that is uh, where you have more uh, more clarity for the supervisor, but at the same time, I'm am, I am uh, speaking about uh, the Twin Peak. So when you go to to, to other uh, governmental stakeholders, they 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 start discussing about the Twin Peak and they forget about the independence part. So so it's it's always complicated to mix two ideas, and especially because you have to go to Congress. And, and about the, the microprudential in this, uh, uh, in this new way of, of, of 
of assessing countries. Um, I know that uh, uh, basically it's, uh, I mean, you, you have to prioritize and, and you have limited resources, but uh, it always preoccupies me that um, right now, I mean, they're, they're making assessments to, to, to the biggest economies or to economies that are uh, globally and systematically uh, relevant. But uh, you never know when, when the next crisis is going to come and where it is going to come. And, and that preoccupies me. Uh, if you remember when, when the FSAP started, they started because of the Tikali crisis in Mexico and then the Japan crisis in the 97s and the Russia crisis. And, uh, and some, uh, I mean, that was a period when the FSAP started. Now uh, they are really worried after the 2008 crisis. But uh, I mean, the new crisis might come from uh, a smaller economy that we are not looking because, uh, and, and that's what worries me about it, this, uh, this view that they have right now. Thank you, Pepe. I think the, is the issues of IMF targeted approach is something that we at the IAS are going to have to explore in more detail because if there is a gap there, we have to consider how best to address those gaps as the supervisors and to, in order to avoid the situations which you just described. So, Damien, perhaps I could ask you, you talked about how there's a reliance in um, your region of relying on the FSAPs to effect change, that there's more, the FSAP has more, not power, but more relevance to your, to supervisors in your region. How can, the self-assessment and peer reviews improve their efficiency or effectiveness so that it could perhaps serve as a additional tool uh, to fill the gap perhaps? Well, uh, in a way here lies the, the whole big issue why on the graph uh, the two assessments so, were so far away from each other. And uh, I've been trying to explain to the authorities and I think we've made uh, last month in Warsaw, a very, a very good step towards bringing the two assessments uh, together, or actually SAPR forward towards um, FSAP. Uh, I try to explain uh, uh, my, my colleagues that it is actually not without a reason that uh, both IAS as well as myself, as well as colleagues who are conducting uh, self-assessments, they, they do it for a reason, and uh, the reason is not because it's, it, it just so happens that there is plenty of academics also on the regulatory side, and they simply like those type of exercises for academic purposes, to gather some observations and to make use of them uh, during different lectures. No, actually, it's because preparing well for self-assessment makes much easier to undergo through something which, like I said, must be done. It's beyond the remits of competences and it has very tangible implications, not only on themselves as the authority, but all economies. And the more emerging markets we're talking about, the more implications there are if the assessment is bad or wrong the more negative if the assessment is against uh, the expectations and very positive if it exceeds expectations. Uh, with this, I've told you also about lack of resources. Uh, this is something I tried also to explain to the authorities. You will never ever get green light for hiring more people if you're budget depends on politicians or authorities like finance ministers if you find convincing argument. And one of the arguments which, uh, which they can use is if we, do well, if we go well through FSAP, if our assessment is positive, perhaps this will affect in a positive way rating of the country and for instance financing of your budget will be cheaper. It is as simple as that. This is something which they haven't considered being focused mainly on, on their daily work and uh, what with my experience I try to pass on and it actually works. We already observed that this argument used in practice 
gave very positive results. So again, uh, the situation can differ market to market. It depends on the stage of development. It depends on for which purpose or why for a particular jurisdiction FSAP is important. But depending on the importance of FSAP, you can uh, choose arguments for encouraging uh, uh, authorities to be better prepared for self-assessments because it's just a tool to go more smoothly through EFSA. Great, thank you. I think we have some audience questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Akram. Um, recognizing that there are some countries where there's obviously resource and capacity issues, but um, I guess I'm interested in, in looking at it from the lens of, of consistency in terms of the application of the ICPs across jurisdictions. And I'm wondering, I'm interested in the panel's views on, on what the best route is to get there. Um, I thought it would be more extensive and, and rigorous uh, FSAPs across jurisdictions and maybe not just partial reviews, but comprehensive across all the ICPs. Um, but now I'm under the impression perhaps that's not going to be the case. So uh, if you could comment, I'd be appreciative. Okay. Uh, who wants to take that? Yeah. I'll take that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, I, I would start by saying I didn't agree necessarily with what Damien said about the uh, uh, self-assessment and peer review being subjective and the FSAPs being objective. Um, I, I think uh, both of them have elements of, uh, of subjectivity and objectivity to them, uh, but they're very different processes. And, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it's good in the FSAP process, you've got an outside person that's coming in and they can look at what's being done. And in that sense, you're getting an objective view of things. Uh, but the problem is that, uh, that nobody could stand to do every FSAP that has to be done and they don't have the time to do it anyhow, but it, it's a very grueling process. And, and so you get a variety of assessors involved, and even though the IMF and the World Bank have peer review of the, uh, of the draft FSAP reports, uh, that's, that's, and you've got uh, many of them two assessors, uh, you still have some variation from one to the other. And so you, you do get some uh, differences of assessment of different jurisdictions that might have a similar situation, find that they get assessed uh, differently by different assessors. Uh, on the, uh, the self-assessment and peer reviews, uh, the advantage of that, I think, is that, uh, that you do have the same set of questions being answered by every supervisor. Uh, the attempt is to make those questions as uh, objective as possible, and so that you're not asking for supervisors' opinions on whether they're observing or not, uh, but asking, uh, actually, do you do this? Do your requirements cover this? Uh, you know, what's been the experience in the last three years? How well is, has it worked? And so, yes, there has to be some judgment there, but, uh, but it's starting from a, a common assessment point. And, and you're looking at uh, a wide range of jurisdictions all at the same point in time as well. And the same expert uh, team is looking at them. And so in that sense, you've got uh, some objectivity uh, that's there that you can't get in the FSAP. Now, what you're missing is the, uh, the follow-up. And so in the, in the self-assessment and peer review process, it's not really possible and practical to go back and say, well, you know, you answered this question this way and this other one that way. Uh, it doesn't seem consistent. Can you explain more about that? You know, in the FSAP, you can do that, but in the self-assessment and peer review, you can't. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, the self-assessment and peer review is uh, Im important uh, input. It, uh, it certainly helps, and it has helped to uh, clarify the standards and principles. So there have been a number of changes made as results of uh, findings out of that process. Uh, you know, some of them come uh, at the stage where I've been involved in, in some of these, of trying to write questions. And so you look at a standard and you say, okay, now what do I want to ask to, uh, to find out uh, how well this is being observed? And some of them I just sit there and scratch my head uh, because you look at the standard and it's so vague that, uh, that you can't, you've you got a hard time coming up with the questions. And so, you know, that helps to trigger improvements in the, uh, in the standards and principles themselves. So I, I think each have their, their place, but in terms of, uh, of 
benchmarking uh, where things stand at a point in time, the self-assessment uh, has a lot to uh, say for it. Great, thank you. We have another audience question. Uh, thank you. Um, I was actually going to ask a question about the change in the FSAPs, uh, but I think your discussion has answered it, Ekram. But what I, I am really concerned about this development in light of the comments that the panelists have made here today and the importance. I mean, I've always thought that the, the FSAP had much to do with the implementation of the ICPs going back to the German reinsurance directive as the sort of first case of the first practical kind of ICP. I, and I'm wondering if the IIS has, I, I don't know if this is driven by the, you know, um, the FSB or, you know, or, or it's just a resource issue, but I think rather than just sort of filling in the gaps, it really would be appropriate for the IIS to, to have some really serious discussions about this, because I, I think that of all the, the time that's put into the developing the ICPs, to take away the, the, clearly the instrument that is doing much to promote them, would be devastating. Thank you, Morik. So I think the IAS uh, is in the process of discussing this. Uh, it's been through the various committees, both implementation committee, financial stability and technical committee, and the executive committee are discussing this issue. And discussions are being held with the IMF. Uh, there is no resolution yet on this issue, but the IMF has proposed in a, a staff note last year to modify the approach for the financially, uh, macro-financially relevant jurisdictions. So those who are members of the FSB, those countries are required to undergo FSAPs every five years. And the IMF's view is that it is not necessary to conduct full FSAPs every five years. It is their belief that regulations do not change that quickly, so a full FSAP every 10 years would be more relevant in their opinion. There are standard setting bodies, including the IIS, uh, BCBS and IOSCO are in discussions with the IMF about this approach. Uh, I think we'll hopefully see a result later this year which will be made public by the relevant standard setting bodies and the IMF, but I think your concerns are shared by many of the IAS members about what this means and then also about what this means for other jurisdictions who are not participating uh, every five years. So your concerns are shared by many and I think stay tuned for more information about that. But. I think we have to wrap up right here. Uh, please join me in thanking my panelists, Michael, Pepe, and Damien. Thank you. Thank you very much, SX. Again, it's excellent uh, panel. And uh, my take out, and I, ass I th assume that uh, many of us uh, take out, is uh, just last uh, question for Marbrak, and this conversation is critically important. And I just quote this uh, Michael's comment that, of course, the whole process, every process is key, but you stress very much prioritization and to make action happen. And that's what we are de really debating. What's going on here in the, from next year or in the near future, IMF, World Bank, EFSA process will be changed, more so-called macro prudential approach, this financial stability approach. As uh, Ekrem mentioned, they are more focused approach, but naturally, as Pepe and Damian mentioned, this F, our assessment process is critical to make a strong, sound regulatory scheme. So how we make this change of FSAP in a positive way, and we are debating, and we try to make prioritize clearly, and also make our action plan happen. So please watch carefully what's going on. And I stress very much this implementation issue is even more important in the future. Now this group of leading by, by ECRAM will take care of GSI methodology, how we assess, and ICP conframe will come in the near future. So thank you very much for, for your panel and your enlightening of this issue. So next panel, so next panel is again a very important panel. I hope 
uh, panelists are here. Uh, cyber risk, 